Hello, everybody. My name is Estella Inda. I am a SJSU librarian. My technical title is Research Services and Social Sciences Librarian. You do not have to know that. Thank you for joining us for our Ban Book Week events. Today we have You Can Ban, You Can Next Books, but they still pop up. Ban Book Week is an annual event that celebrates the, the freedom to read with the purpose of placing the spotlight on the harms of censorship. This annual event is celebrated by librarians, booksellers, publishers, journalists, teachers, and readers. And it is now my pleasure to, to introduce Dr. Jonathan Gomez from Chicana and Chicano Studies Department. Right on, how's everyone doing? Well, this is a, an event on Chicana, Chicano, Chicanex activism and literature. So I, I think we need a little louder response. How are y'all doing? All right. That's a little better. I appreciate that. Thank you so much to all the students and to, you know, Estella, Ella, and Elias, the three E's that make this event happen. I really appreciate all the students here, right, that are here. I see so many from, you know, my own class as well as from our department and other majors. As you know, from taking our class, right, this is, it's, you know, we're talking about ethnic studies. It's always an urgent moment to do so, right, because we know that our communities are under attack and that our scholarship, our activism, our art, everything that emerges from our ethnic communities is part of the solution to get us free, right? I think that, you know, before I introduce, you know, my department chair who will introduce our, our guest speaker today, I want to read a poem. You know, when I was thinking about this event, I got this book right here. It's called Ban This, the BSP Anthology of Chicana Chicano Literature. And it's edited by Santino Rivera from 2012. And this book was this book was created because of a struggle to ban Mexican American La Raza studies in Arizona, right? Which for a time, the officials in Arizona did make the study of Chicana Chicano studies illegal, right? This was in 2012. And so I have a poem in this book, right? And the poem is called There Are No Criminals Here. And I wrote it partly for, you know, what was going down in the, uh, with the ban, but partly because what was going down in my community of the Barrio of City Terrace in East LA. I wrote this poem because one morning there was a ex LAPD officer named Anthony Razo who shot himself, but blamed it on two bald headed Latinos in my neighborhood. It took several weeks for the investigation to figure out that he actually shot himself and blamed it on two young Latinos. But in those weeks, hundreds of kids were pulled into various police stations Hundreds of police officers raided houses and blocked streets and took people that fit the description of bald-headed Latino into jails, right? And so I, I write this poem to remember, as well as a protest against the study and the appreciation of Chicana Chicano or Chicanex studies. Right? So the title is, There Are No Criminals Here. <clears throat> We have been blamed before and we're sure it won't be the last time. Officer down at 4.15 a.m. on a Saturday morning and the barrio near, Fol near Folsom and Hazard is already under siege. A search and destroy mission for two bald-headed Latinos in a community of bald-headed Latino youth. But we know the lie was constructed over, century, over a century ago. Blamed over and again, prosecuted and punished to the fullest extent of the law, book thrown at us with impunity, gun pointed at the back of our heads, hands on the hood as we assume the position, spotlight checked, and helicopter surveillance. Stop before I shoot called out too many times. But there are no criminals here. Just people surviving against all odds, multi and never ending circumstances of racial repression, class war accompanied with post traumatic stress syndrome like symptoms, martial law like conditions, police tactics to transform brown and black pearls into perils with canines searching the perimeter, the violence of a gun and a badge, protected by judges who devour justice with courtroom motions. You once had your freedom, then you don't. But there are no criminals here. We're the, worm, the warmers of the morning cold, unprotected authors of a dream, marching in the streets in solidarity with the demonized and cardboard house sleepers. 
but they see probable felon and easy target. And they scream, put your hands on top of your head, kill, incarcerate, deport, gay bash, good for nothing, divide and rule, violating every single one of our rights before they send in the dogs. But my people, we must always remember there are no criminals here. Thank you. So I, I share that poem, right? Thank you so much. And I, and I share that poem because, you know, for as long as I've known about the scholarship, the art and activism of Dr. Elias Serna, I, I see him as part of this important Chicanx radical tradition to stand up and fight back when our communities are under attack, right? And so, you know, part of this book here, right, this anthology, I, I, I see that emanating out of the kinds of engagements that you've been involved in across you know, the Southwest, right? Across Aslan, right? But, you know, my department chair will introduce Elias further, but I'm, I'm really proud to introduce our chair of Chicano Chicano Studies, Dr. Ella Maria Diaz. In the time, <laughs> that's right, in, in the time that they've been here at SJSU, they've been extremely supportive of myself as a faculty member, as someone in the community that engages with our Chicanx communities and to have a ton of respect for what you do and your vision. So, so thank you, Ella. But Dr. Ella Maria Diaz is a professor and chair of the Department of Chicano Chicano Studies here at SJSU. She specializes in Chicana, Chicano art, performance, and political activism during the U.S. civil rights era, and in the visual and cultural analysis of testimonio as an art of the Americas. Her first book, Flying Under the Radar with the Royal Chicano Air Force, Mapping a Chicano Chicana Art History, won the 2019 National Association for Chicana Chicano Studies Book Award. In 2021, her second book, Jose Montoya, received gold medal awards for best arts book and best biography from the International Latino Book Awards. Among several chapters and journal articles, Diaz's 2017 essay in Atzlan, a journal of Chicano studies, was anthologized in the Chicano Studies Reader an anthology of Atzlan, 1970 to 2016. Please help me give a warm welcome to our chair of Chicano Chicano Studies, Dr. Diaz. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here today in community. I'm really excited to be amongst students and colleagues and certainly Dr. Serna. It's my pleasure and also my honor to introduce Dr. Serna and his talk today, as well as his exhibition. I hope that all of you make it down or make it up. We're on the second floor to the fifth floor next to Akna to check out a, a slice of his award-winning exhibition of Chicana Chicano First Edition. It's right next to the meeting room. So do see it on your way out if you have time today. Dr. Serna won first place in the 2013 National Collegiate Book Collecting Contest from the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America for this, uh, this collection of first editions. And the ABAA was founded in 1949 to promote interest in rare and antiquarian books and book collecting and to foster collegial relations. And this award is a big deal for Chicana Chicano people and Chicana scholars in particular. And Dr. Cerna will certainly tell you why and share some of the reasons why today. But one major reason why it's a big deal is the suppression of our literature, our cultural memory, and our contributions to the nation writ large. For many of us in public education, including Dr. Serna, the consciousness raising that takes place when a trickle of us move through the MA and PhD processes of Western institutions is both a sheer ecstasy, but then a deep pain of the discovery of our literary history and the intellectual historiography of Chicanidad. The pain comes shortly after the excitement of this moment because each of us in that moment realizes that the books were always there, right? But it took graduate school and then advanced degree education to discover them. Another form of barrier of keeping these texts from us. How many of you can relate to, wait, this was written when? Why didn't I know about this in high school? So that journey continues as you move on through your degree programs and your master's. Why don't we have access to this, to this literature? So Dr. Serna earned his PhD in English and rhetoric in 2017 from UC Riverside, his MFA from UCLA and his BA in English from UC Berkeley, all public universities of California. He's a longtime professor of ethnic studies and Chicana Chicano studies in Southern California community colleges and at other CSU campuses, which now includes our own as he joined us this fall as a preeminent lecturer in our department of Chicana and Chicano studies. D 
deeply committed to ethnic studies from its pedagogy to its his history of political activism. Dr. Cerna works with the Chicano Institute for Teaching and Organizing, or CHITO, which is hilarious, that's the acronym, which is also led by front lines and vanguard ethnic studies teachers and scholars. Dr. Serna is co-founder of the Chicano pop-up book movement, which begins roughly around 2014-15 and amid the book bans of that decade. But what I'm also excited to introduce you to today briefly with Dr. Serna is his co-founding and ongoing performance work with the Chicano Secret Service. As recently as 2019, the Chicano Secret Service has performed across Aslan at conferences, community events, and various street happenings, connecting the ad-libbed and social political urgency of El Teatro Campesino to the urban aesthetics of Asco and the satirical comedy sketches of In Living Color that preceded the Chappelle Show and Key and Peele. From SPIC, or Space Prison Industrial Complex in Fear of a Brown Planet, to Do the Riot Thing, Chicano Secret Service began in 1988 as a comedy troupe, and it's part of the Chicano radical performance tradition. Through political satire, the Chicano Secret Service imagines a culture of liberation and emancipation as they respond to the neoliberal racial capitalist moment of the late 80s to the present. We're certainly in one right now. In his own dissertation, founding member Tomas Carrasco calls Chicano Secret Services theater an oppositional performance that originates from within the contested historical context between the dominant neoliberal bloc and the emergent Chicano art performance bloc. Along with Carrasco and Serna, other members of the Chicano Secret Service include Susan Carrasco, Eduardo Lopez, and Lalo Alcaraz. Many of you may know him from his syndicated cartoon, and as well as Coco. Their work has been cited in numerous books, including a companion to 20th century American drama, Dr. Coco Fusco's 2001 anthology of Latin American performance art, The Bodies That Were Not Ours, Dr. Cha Noriega's Shot in America, Television, The State, and the Rise of Chicano Cinema, and Jose Antonio Berciaga's Spilling the Beans. So without further ado, I can't wait to present to you, uh, Dr. Serna, we're about to have some serious fun. Thank you very much. Wow, now, now I really got to bring something. Um, first of all, are any of my students here? I'm about to take roll. No. Let me see, I, raise hands. I met two. Wow. So uh, please, after the talk, please try to, maybe while we're setting up Q&A, just run up here and say hello and, and I have something for you. So many thanks. I, I'm just going to squeeze them in. Estela, the librarian, for really uh, stepping up and I have not seen the exhibit. I've seen pictures of the exhibit and I'm so excited. Books, you know, I collected some books. I, I, I valued them. I treasured them. I carried them with me everywhere I went. They were like my holy books and they end up at, a, at an exhibit. It, it's really, uh, gosh, it, it's, it's a high honor. It's great to see Jonathan, an old friend. We came up as grad students together. We were not in the same campus, but we had, we shared, we had mutual friends, mutual close friends. And I feel like I'm part of that tradition. As another of our professors here, Johnny Ramirez, Johnny Rocket, better known as Johnny Rocket in Southern California. I don't think you should call him that up here, especially, you know, because if he has a grade book, but, you know, I wanted to say, you know, how many grad students are here in the room? Some grad students? All right, we're going to ding them. We're going to ding them later on. But, but, you know, but it's really, there's a message for the undergrads, you know, we need you in the, in the upper echelons of, of academia, of society, of leadership. You know, it's always, it's so important to follow up. You know, when I was an undergrad, I remember a lot of the grad students and the professors would encourage us, hey, don't just stop here. Go get your master's, your PhD, your MFA, right? Get, get certified. Get those credentials. Um, get, get those keys that are going to unlock some doors, not only for yourself, but for our communities, for where we come from. So I did want to just uh, put that out. And then, of course, Ella. Ella Diaz, the chair of Chicana Chicano Studies. Um, such an important field, you know, it nurtured me. 
And and now here I am, you know, in, in a new position. The the tables turn and and um as a professor, even in, in the professional world here, we we rely so much on the mentors, the guides, the supporters. And and I want to really express a heartfelt thank you, Ella, for always, you know, just helping me out, being in the corner. And you know what, consejo, advice is so important. I think uh, in Mexican, uh, Central American, Latinx communities, the, the word consejo kind of means a lot more. It's, 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 um, it's a heartfelt advice, you know, like I care for you and, and this is the advice I'm going to, I'm going to give you out of love, you know, out of the concern for you. And I think that's, it's gotten me, got me a plane ticket up to Northern California. And I'm so excited to be here. I teach an online class and I really want to, I want to meet some of my students too. And, and I just to honor you, let's give all of us ourselves a round of applause for being here. Um, Raul, Raul Rodriguez, where are you? Raul, there he is in the back. Let's, let's check him out. This is my old roommate from college y'all some of y'all are sitting next to your roommates and we're just pals you know we're living the, the moment well guess what that might be a lifelong friend my friend Raul you know what Raul was my guide I thought I was the tough guy on campus Raul's a year older than me and uh, we we're both English majors Chicano English majors that's like dodo birds you know you hardly ever see them and yeah, we took some classes together, survived. You know what? Raul's the funniest guy in the world. He always make me laugh. And he was, he was up here as a Norteño. And I was a Sureño. <laughs> and, you know, my best friends were from Jose, from San Jose, and Raul from, from Chole, Soledad. And man, we, we just I have just had so many just happy times. And then we're doing serious work. We'd go out and, and, and study together we're such nerds nerdos right someone should make a t-shirt nerdo sell it at all the campus you'll make a million dollars <laughs> who needs who needs a pell grant uh, <laughs> i changed the title because i wanted to make this pertinent to today there's a book ban y'all uh, sometimes the californians you know we don't we don't feel the urgency because you know what? We're not under attack. But imagine living in Florida, Texas, you know, Arkansas, my goodness, where it is a crime, y'all, to pick up one of those free books back there. There are students facing 10 years in prison just for standing up and going to a protest. 10 years in prison. I'm glad. You know, Professor Gomez mentioned that criminalization. You know, we as Californians, we should be all too familiar with criminalization. California locks up more people per, per citizens than any other state. And the United States locks up more people than any other country. We, th we say China, China's so repressive. I'm glad I'm not living in Russia. Well, guess what? You're living in California. and They lock up people more than China and Russia, right? We, we live in a criminal state. And today, these, these ideas, y'all, the ideas are being criminalized. And particularly, Black studies, queer studies books, queer YA literature, young adult literature, and then Chicano studies books, ethnic studies books, critical race theory. They, they've been targeted for criminalization. And I want to dive a little more into what that's about and what we can do about it because i think this talk should really also have a dimension of like what can we do about it raul rodriguez is also the proprietor of la plaza bakery wherever salinas get some delicious bandulce at la plaza oh my god he would come he would come he would go to I would miss him. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, Raul, I never told you. Whenever you left on the weekends, I missed you. But you know what? We would always send off Raul. We would say, you know what? You should go to 
Soledad this weekend. You got to go, you know, connect with your family. But the real reason, Raul, was because you would come back with that little pink box. You know, the pink box of pan dulce? Who knows what I'm talking about? Come on, see some hands. And especially if there's a little bit of grease on the bottom, you're like, oh gosh, those, those are the conchas, the cuernos. Oh my goodness. Um, in true ethnic studies fashion, we've been building so much, y'all, in these last 10 years. Chicano studies, ethnic studies, Black studies, Asian American studies, Native American studies, y'all, has, has grown and strengthened in these last decades. This is a beautiful time to be in college. And it's because of a movement. And the beautiful thing about ethnic studies today is like this growth has also come with, as Franz Fanon said, responsibility. We need to be sharp about how we teach ethnic studies. We need to honor the traditions, retrieve those early traditions, and, and, then, and then hone our, our teaching and pedagogy, the style of how we teach. And so one of the practices, we've also been you know, sharpening our practices, and I love this from Native American studies has, has gifted us this, this practice of honoring where we sit, you know, we're, and, I, and I do want to acknowledge where we are on, on ancient Ohlone lands. I think there's a, another group, there, there, there's other groups. I know that center to the south, but are there any other groups, indigenous groups here in San Jose? There's, there's no, no, Wekma Ohlone reservation. Oh, Wekma Ohlone. I I, and I saw that, I, I looked at the map before I came up and I come from Tongva, Gabrileño and Chumash lands in Southern California. And I'm originally from South Central San Luis Potosí, Pame Otomi, Pame Chichimeca Otomi indigenous lands, unceded. And so I want to recognize that, that we are on unceded indigenous lands. And I want to honor these ancestors that were, that came to me through ethnic studies and, and pre-Chicano studies. Betita Martinez, who I'll recognize in a minute, brother El Haj Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X. When I was a basketball player in high school, I remember some of the, some of the guys, one of the guys, Carlton Davenport from Santa Monica High School, had, had a book tucked into his back pocket, the autobiography of Malcolm X. And I was like, oh man, what's you reading? What is that? You know, a basketball player carrying a book and he would open it up before practice and 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 read it and and I asked him what well, what is that you know cuz I grew up watching speed racer and his older brother the mysterious racer x so I said this this book looks cool you know and it sure was and and uh I identified with Malcolm X I had a a a, a parent killed you know as a young child alienation in schools in spite of like this this amazing potential you grew up with you know you, you know you're so brilliant as a child and your friends are brilliant but you know teachers look down at you like you're, you're going to be a gardener or something when you grow up you know and and transformation he was always uh Johnny Ramirez and myself we worked at a youth center Pico Youth and Family Center we 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 would always celebrate Malcolm X day it rattled the town, you know, and, and there was always these beautiful themes that, that his life was about. But one was resilience and transformation. He was always transforming. Gloria Anzaldúa, the beautiful, lovely work of Gloria Anzaldúa, Borderlands. She's one of the most revered writers in, in Chicano studies literature. The only Chicana in the rhetorical tradition. That's like the encyclopedia of world rhetoric. Ronald Takaki, one of my professors at UC Berkeley, I sat across the table with him and the chancellor negotiating the American culture's requirement. When I was a student like you all, I was a rabble rouser. We used to get arrested occupying buildings to pressure the university to hire ethnic studies faculty. 
And, and then we got, we got the American cultures, an early version of the ethnic studies requirement. And he was one of the only ethnic studies professors that, that, that uh, stood by us, you know. And I teach his book, A Different Mirror, banned in Arizona, a banned book, A Different Mirror, the Multicultural History of the United States. And then up at the top, John Trudell, the Native American poet attacked by the FBI, which many, many presume killed his family in uh, 1975, murdered in, uh, his family in a, in a mysterious arson fire uh, while he burned the flag in Washington, D.C., and, and persisted, went into hiding and, and reemerged as a poet, using his words, his lines to kind of uh, decolonize and continue to liberate us all. But I want to highlight Ruben Salazar, the Pulitzer Prize winning LA Times newspaper writer. Hey, go out and get a job at a newspaper. That would be a huge accomplishment. How about win some prizes? Great. How about win the Pulitzer, the prize for the baddest writer in the whole nation? A Pulitzer Prize winning writer who during the Chicano movement in Los Angeles, he became the news director of Channel 34, and he was writing about the, the LAPD murder of the Sanchez cousins. He was writing about the Brown Berets, about these young kids walking out of high schools and clamoring for something called Chicano studies. And he was writing about this, and the sheriffs hated him, and the LAPD detested him. And he was assassinated during the Chicano moratorium shot in the head at a bar during a riot, mysteriously by LA sheriffs. And, and this is censorship at, his, at an extreme level, you know, when they kill us. And as John Trudell would say, sometimes they have to kill us. They have to kill us because they can't break our spirit. And so I wanna honor people that have been censored and, and you know, we still, we carry their books. They're like holy books to us. And speaking of holy books, you know, I have one of my treasures in the exhibit is this book, but it doesn't say 500. It was popularized in the 90s when there was a, a youth uprising up here in the Bay Area. It was really big. I remember they, the kids walked out of San Francisco schools and then the Oakland kids walked out of the schools and they met on the Oakland Bridge. They shut down the Oakland Bridge. And I was like, that's some fascinating protests. Then they got into a fight. And then, the, no, they didn't. No, they didn't. It's about unity today. And, and this book, Betita was writing stories about that. She was telling us those stories of the student strikes. And so I have a uh, my copy, when I was a, a high school kid, my older brother was at Santa Monica Community College, and he, he brought this book home. And, and back in the 80s, when I was in high school, it was titled 460 Years of Chicano History, because it was originally published in 76 uh, for the Bicentennial. It was all this patriotism, and, and it had to have been influenced by that post-Vietnam War era, the Chicano movement had been, you know, had been going full steam. And then it was, it was violently attacked. You know, the civil rights movement was violently attacked. My friend, my co-collaborator, John Avalos, was in high school at Madera, at Madera High School up here. And he says that when they murdered Ruben Salazar, it had a silencing effect that, you know, Chicanos felt like, oh, they had to tone down because they had murdered him. And he had a, a radical teacher. The next semester, she disappeared. People were in hiding or had been made to scatter. And, and so Martinez edited this beautiful book out of New Mexico. And it reached me in, in this little vario in Southern California. And it just, I couldn't put it down. I read like 50 pages at a time. I read the book like in three or four days. I couldn't put it down. Literally, when they say, hey, it was a page turner. And as an 11th grader in high school, this book gave me all of my history. It gave me centuries of knowledge. 
And overnight, almost literally, I became a Chicano. I was like, I ain't Spanish. Back in the old days, we didn't say Hispanic. We would straight up say Spanish. Tortillas, what's that? You know, and and it was transformative. It, it really gave me like a purpose in life. Um, and that's the reason why I'm not in the NBA or else I would have been a professional basketball player. But God's bless Elizabeth Martinez. These are the books. These are the, the books on target. And it's also kind of chronological. The critical race theory, you have that image of, oh, what's that Dorco guy? Cruz from Texas, holding up critical race theory. Have you read that? You know, based on what, what he was spewing about, it was so much hate. It's a book of theory written primarily by law professors. And, you know, and the um, frameworks, the tenets, principles of critical race theory, like interest convergence, intersectionality, how our identities intersect. That's a powerful one, right? Counter story, the counter story. These tools gave us in ethnic studies so much power. I've been reading, I've been using critical race theory as many of us in ethnic studies for decades, y'all. Decades. It's one of the sharpest tools we have in the box because one of their ideas is that, you know, what's, what are the limits of our rights? What are the, 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 the capacity the capacities of justice in our society. How can we fend off discrimination? And and they're, they're, uh, a key to their their um, theorizing is it's it all boils down to jurisprudence, to laws, right? We we're a nation of laws, and so they analyze race and racial justice and racisms, and and importantly, how institutionalized racism operates in our society historically and today on the field of, of laws and justice and courts. It's powerful, right? And they're over here banning, it, banning this, saying that it's communistic, right? And, and then here in the middle, the 1619 project, that happened at the end of the Trump administration. Once the 1619 project got traction, I was I was all about this thing a couple of years back called Chicano Time. And I was calling it Chicano Time 2019 because that's the 500 year anniversary of when Cortez crosses the Southern Causeway onto perhaps one of the most magnificent cities on the planet, the Aztec city, Tenochtitlan, sitting on an island in the middle of an immense lake and 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 they they a few days later they kidnap the emperor Motecuc Soma and and then the war breaks out a two year war and then it's the takedown of not just the Aztecs but it's the the settler colonialism y'all of the hemisphere that was a 500 year anniversary of of something that, that Chicanos and, and Central Americans and Latinx folks, that, that's our, D, our cultural DNA, you know? And I thought the uh, 2019 is so important. And then simultaneously, the 1619 project came out. I was like, what's that? What's going on there? And it just happens to be the 400 year anniversary of the institution of slavery, right? And, and these profound ideas Nicole Hannah Jones edited this collection, which was at first, it's a very accessible, uh, beautiful, it's like, a, I think like a 80 page installment in the New York Times Magazine, free online, just Google 1619 Project. You have immediate access to this beautiful document. And their thesis was simple. K through 12 is, Sla the institution and the history and the impact of slavery is undertaught. Our students do not know enough about this. And in fact, it's not just a phase or an episode. 
It's like a 300 plus year foundation of this nation, you know, and, and the, the thorn in the Republicans um, uh, pocket is this, that the, 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 another premise of the 1619 project is it's not 1776. It's 1619 when it starts and it's before. And, and then the preface, Nicole Hannah Jones talks about a book that changed her mind when she was taking a black studies class in high school. And it was called Before the Mayflower. And, and the Mayflower arrives in 1620. And in 1619, the white lion arrives, a ship carrying the precious cargo, the first enslaved Africans on the coast of present day Virginia. And, and she explains that, that she never knew that, that her people were here, her ancestors were here before the Mayflower, before the Mayflower. And that it's so important and, and that, you know, think about it. We call ourselves the wealthiest country in the world. How did that happen? 300 years, y'all, of free, exploited, inhumane, dehumanizing labor the cotton industry and tobacco created the wealthiest men in the world in the South. They were living in the South and the North, the liberal North. Well, they had the banking system and, and the industry and they created the tools. So they had a neat relationship, right? Why don't we know this, right? And so this precious knowledge, this history, Trump and the Republicans went after it. It's always for terrible reasons like presidential elections. We need demons to vilify. And so they, uh, he created the 1776 Commission, the 1776 Project. How derivative, boring. And, and so that's where that attack came out of. At the end of his presidency, trying to, you know, fan his... Uh, his base, rally his base. And then to the left, we have the most banned book right now in the United States, uh, Gender Queer by Maya Kobabe, uh, who taught me the pronoun air and, and these, you know, and all it is is a memoir of a, of a young person growing up in a, in a girl's body. And then uh, on a journey through gender identity, right? And, and, and not finding a home in gay, lesbian, bisexual identities, having to explore and investigate. And I was having a, a conversation with my students last week at Cal State Hotel California. I'm sorry, Cal State Channel Islands in Camarillo. And thank you. Thank you for that chuckle. I appreciate that. And we're saying, why is this book banned? And the Republicans call it pornography. And I read, I read the book last week, and I a beautiful, you know, uh, a beautifully written, real personal, a deep dive into a, 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 a very honest um, prose about the exploration of one's own sexual identity, right? And, and, and we were saying like, who, you know, wh what is the purpose of this book? And first off is for the author to explore their own sexual identity. A and as they state, in order that someone out there, even if it's just one, two, or 20 of us in the room are like, gosh, so glad. They put it on paper because I'm experiencing something like that. Identification, y'all, representation, seeing yourself in a book. I mean, who's against that? Hardly any of us, right? That's important. And you know what else is important? Empathy. Lorna D. Cervantes in a podcast we did on banned books a month ago through Knox said, 
we need to develop, y'all, our frontal lobes. Our frontal lobes. Because who cannot check out a person with a beautiful frontal lobe? No, it's not about that. It's not about that. It's about where we, we develop empathy in our brain. I mean, it's also in our heart and our bodies, but developing understanding, critical understanding, critical thinking, and empathy develops in the frontal lobe. And, and she said, that's why, and we do that through reading, y'all, reading signs, abstracting things, and trying to, trying to enter someone else's life through a book, right? And understanding and experience. And and one of my students, we also, in the discussion, we said, and who in the heck says this? I was a Christian, straight boy. And then I read a book and I turned gay. Darn books. Who says that? Nobody says that. I should get a few more chuckles, y'all. That's kind of funny. Like who says, I read this book and now I'm gay. No, it doesn't happen like that, right? So even the foundations of these conservative attacks are poorly founded. We have to call them out. We have to laugh at them, y'all. We have to laugh in their face. It could be a, a weapon of the future. And, and you know, they bring up the, um, the, I don't know, what is, let's see, how do we get rid of that? It, would this do it? No. Yeah, you know what? Let's just leave it. It's not important. Um, it's the First Amendment. That little X might do it. There we go. That's fine. Okay. I think that's perfect. The There's a really important lawsuit right now by PEN America. PEN America represents writers in the United States. They're suing the state of Florida. This, this will make more sense at the end of the presentation as well, because there's a struggle, a fight to take the fight to Florida because the, the laws there are very rigid. And again, why are people banning books? You know why? Because they're running for president. That's why. It's all just a facade. There's no substance in the book bans. It's all for political purposes at the expense of young people's growth. You know, a whole generation of, of young people can be affected by criminalizing these books. And it's all because selfish individuals want to rule the world. It's as basic as that, to be president of the United States. So on the basis of the rights to free speech and, and be able to read freely, and also the 14th Amendment, which protects anybody, especially based, in, in this case, on gender and gender identity. You have the right to, to be represented in schools and curriculum and literature. And then we have the notorious Texas book ban. This is a um, uh, the most rid, the most horrendous attack on freedom of speech. And let me just show you something. This is a 16-page document of books. I don't know why this is acting up. Where is the arrow? It disappeared. Is it? There it is. Huh. It kind of froze on me. Let me see. Oh, can we get a tech person? Because this, I'll need to get back to the PowerPoint eventually. I don't know why it froze. It's this, you know what? It's because I was picking on the CIA and the FBI. <laughs> you know, let's get this guy. Um, a 16-page document. I'll buy you some time. So I was going to scroll through this. I was going. I was trying to set up a timer and just make it scroll by itself magically. But imagine uh, over 480 books outlawed. So the there's rules in Texas where a parent can complain. So the conservatives are organizing through fabricated parent groups, and they pull out books, particularly having to do with black studies, uh, gender, 
in queer studies, which they're labeling as pornography, and ethnic studies literatures. So what we're learning, who's in an ethnic studies class or has taken an ethnic studies class? Raise your hand. All right. And if your hand is not raised, you need to take this class. I tell my students, um, did you do the reading? I don't, I don't ask. I can kind of tell. And I'm like, look, y'all, we need to read this literature. Okay. You know, when I was growing up, you could also hit the machine or throw a shoe. Does anyone have a shoe? <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I and, for, and I know this from a lesson from 10 years ago when Arizona was attacked. I would tell my Chicanx literature students, I'll say, hey, we need to read three chapters of Bless Me Ultima this week. Uh, so let's let's get to it, you know, get started. And we would self-reflect on where we do our reading, where we're most productive, what time in the day, space, right? Where we go to, to do our study. We're college students. We got to get down to study. And I would tell them this. I go, I know phones are out. Phones are are, are sucking up our attention. That's the new medium, right? And, and there's something else. The legislatures in Arizona don't want you to read Bless Me Ultima. They say it's, uh, it's divisive. It's un-American, and it promotes resentment towards white people. Preposterous claims, right? And so if you're... You're not going to do the reading, then you're doing what the Arizona legislatures want you to do. And do you really want to do that? You know? Oh, yes. Zoom it back. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and so that's that's another reason to read these banned books, right? Because people are telling us not to read them, right? And then you know, the next slide is. Arizona. And, and that's a key pivot in my talk right now, because we're experiencing, y'all, a book ban, a major national book ban. And as Chicanos, we've been here before. And, and 11 years ago, the state of Arizona, our next door neighbors, they outlawed Chicanx, Latinx studies books. And we we responded. We had a battle back, right? I wonder if any of this, no. Nope. No, we're still working on it, right? Good. Yeah. If I bang my head on the keyboard, you think? Mm -hmm. No, no, you know, I'm just going to keep talking and let the slides catch up. Just do it from memory. So, Arizona. In Arizona, they, they started attacking a Mexican-American studies department. And let me tell you a little bit about that. Johnny Ramirez was there. We used to ride in cars that would never break down in the desert. And we'd go out there. We'd go to the, the protests, the meetings. That was a funny thing. We started going out to Tucson. So I'd never been to Tucson, except at the Greyhound bus stop. And they started saying, these guys, they, they live here, don't they? they? They live in Tucson. They thought we were from Tucson as well because we were always showing up at these conferences and rallies. And in 2011, they, in 2011, they, destroyed, they passed the law to destroy the department. And beautiful thing. They started taking over the school board and shutting it down. And they wouldn't allow the school board to function for a whole year, every month. Are we back? Yes. Yes. Thank you. An applause, please, to our technical folks. Where would we be? Let me see. Uh, I'm trying to. Oh, is it? I'm just trying to get back. Oh, to the slide. Sweet. Oh my God. And I could go this year too, right? Better fact. Thank you. Um, and they sh they kept the department alive two semesters the entire year 2011 
Jan Brewer signed the bill early in 2011. And so for a whole year, they kept the department alive. And then in January 2012, the earth was supposed to end, but they only destroyed the, a beautiful department that was transforming lives. The, does anyone know the dropout rate for Chicano Latinx students nationally? It tends to hover at the same rate. Anybody know? Educators? How about the professors? 74, 42? Ramir, Professor Ramirez? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say 50. Sometimes it's around 50 or half. The educational, the Chicano educational pipeline studies and Oh, thank you. Thank you. And Madonna it now. And the, I can't say, I can't say I'm swifting it. I, and Chegastro. And the, the dropout rate, the pushout rate was about 50% nationally. In, in Tucson, the, the students were graduating at close to 100%. Some years, the there was an 87% graduation to higher education, y'all. They're going to college. In these ethnic studies classes, they're developing a college-going identity. They were improving their study skills. They were engaging in schools. Their attendance, GPA, test scores skyrocketed. They were performing better than the white students in the Tucson Unified School District. Educators talk about closing the achievement gap in, in the Mexican-American Studies Department. They inverted the achievement gap. Students enrolled in the Chicago Studies classes were outperforming white students. And, and the, the state attacked it, shut down that department, and, and we, we rose up. We had an uprising. And the students were doing these massive protests and they were doing runs. I remember they ran across the desert in 116 degree weather, over a hundred miles from Tucson to Phoenix to the capital. And that caught my attention. I thought, whoa, this means something. And so a movement sprung out of the Sonoran Desert and we brought it back to California. And look at these, these books. Our precious books, some of these are out there. Occupied America, the Chicano Bible, we used to call it. Our creation story. And also because when you read your history, you have a whole new outlook on who you are. Your self-esteem goes up. Your worldview opens up, right? It's transformative. And we took it personally when they were banning these books. How do we respond? We responded regionally, nationally. The Texans came out with the Libro Traficante, performative protest. They said, you know what? We're going to, since it's a crime to read Chicano books, we're going to smuggle them back into Arizona. And I thought, those Tejanos, narco Tejanos, the other narco traficante references. It was creative, y'all. They even got Californians. I remember the Oxnard people. They started one in Oxnard, went through L.A. When, oh, we got someone from Oxnard in the house. Look out. And Oxnard led a Libro Traficante caravan. And out west, we came up with the Chicano pop-up book movement. Say it with me, y'all. I'll say you can ban Chicano books, and then you all yell, but they still pop up. You can ban Chicano books. Still, you can ban Chicano books. I'm going to try to do Jedi mind tricks and turn all you guys into militant activists. Um, and there was a moment in the early 2010s where they said, because this was it, we're trying to save ethnic studies. And then it was destroyed. The teacher started a lawsuit that went to the federal level that was partly resolved up here in San Francisco at the Ninth District Court of Appeals. And they eventually won it. 
many years later in 2017, but the department remained destroyed. And so we lost that battle. Chicano said he's never revived in Tucson. And, but, but, you know, they told us at one point, instead of just saving ethnic studies, let's spread it. And so we, we started a movement out here in California, in Califas, in New Mexico, Texas, and, and California. It's always powerful out here. Whatever we do out here, it goes out nationally, hemispherically, sometimes globally. And we spread ethnic studies. The symbolism, the arts always play a role. And so there was another beautiful concept from the Nicaraguan priest Ernesto Cardenal in his beautiful poem, The Epitaph to the Tomb of Adolfo Baez Bonet. And at the end, you know, it's about a, a Sandinista revolutionary who's disappeared. They capture him, murder him, torture him, and then they, they bury his body where no one can find it. And the, the poet Cardenal writes, you know, eh, now everywhere you are not buried, you're rising again. And they thought they buried you, but what they did was to bury a seed. And so that became one of our slogans. They tried to bury us, but we were seeds. And look at it. Look where we are now, you know, 11 years later, and ethnic studies is a requirement in all high schools in the state of California. Every single high school has developed an ethnic studies class. And the CSU did a magical thing, and a lot of credit is due to the Black Studies departments that led our charge in the Cal State system and all the ethnic studies departments passing the Area F requirement. And look what that did. Every Cal State University student has to take an ethnic studies class, has to be a critical thinker around race. And you know what that did? That caused every single community college over a hundred community colleges in the state of California to develop ethnic studies classes and programs. Talk about seeds growing, right? That's, that's what a movement, a movement created that. And then this is the Chicano pop-up book creation story. You know, we're part of that struggle. The Rasa studies was about a little over a decade when it was attacked by Arizona Republicans. And then as a response, this is also something that's tied to the book collection. So, you know, uh, I mentioned several of us were, were grad students, we're getting our PhDs. And I was at uh, University of California at Riverside, getting my PhD in English with specializations in rhetoric and Chicano ethnic literatures. And uh, I would always see, I don't know if the librarians have it here, the uh, book collecting contest. A book, do you guys have a book collecting contest? We could start one. And I would see a flyer and it said, book collecting contest, $500. You know, I am a little ghetto. I could use those $500. Yes, yes. But it also comes from, the nerdo in me. I have books. I think I can win this. And, and it all it was an interesting convergence of cosmic forces. So I was getting my, I was doing my exams, my PhD exams. So I happened to have a bibliography, an annotated bibliography. 2013, Arizona has just been attacked. We're, we're, there's a movement also in full swing that we're a part of. And then the book collecting contest happens. And I, I, scramble it together, submit my uh, bibliography, and I win first prize, y'all. First prize. I was so happy. And this is the way my friend Ron Espiritu says, this is the way I have to say it. I won first prize in a uh, book collecting contest. And then the librarian said, you know what? Send it to the national because, you know, we always do that. Whoever wins, we Clean it. You have a week to clean it up your bibliography, send it to the National. So I sent it to Washington, D.C., the Antiquarian Book uh, uh, Sellers Association, and the Library of Congress. 
and I won first place in the National Book Collecting Contest. $1,500, y'all. I was really happy. I talked them into buying me two extra plane tickets. I took my two kids, went to DC for the first time. We arrived, it was when the, 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 the country was closed. What was it? You know, because of the budget and stuff. And we landed and the, the DC opened. It was partly because I was arriving and those parties in the streets because the government's opening, but also part, partly because I was getting an award. And, and it was a big celebration. And I asked John Avalos, oh, can you help me do this book display? And, and John Avalos Rios, one of the founders of, of Pioneer in Mexican dance, Pale Folklorico, here in California. He was also a featured dancer in the movie Zoot Suit. Who's seen the movie Zoot Suit? Everyone should watch it this weekend. And then next week, you're going to be talking like a pachuco. Hey, I got to go to Glecha. I'm not reading that until I do this. Anyhow, you have to watch the movie. Changes the way you talk and behave. And then uh, he made, he goes, I'm going to make pop-up books. And, and I said, what? Oh, that's, yeah, it sounds cool. He's, uh, he's got that arts and crafts training background. And then, and then it just, boom, it was like a little explosion. We said, you know what? We can make pop-up books with, my, with our students and it'll be an allegory. Oh my gosh, it's an allegory, a symbolic story of you know this this book banning it goes against book banning you can ban the book but it's still gonna pop up and then it became an allegory for spreading ethnic studies right you can bury the seed and it'll pop up somewhere else and then it was a general allegory for rising up for uprising right protest and then i want to emphasize that their, their intersectional nature to the pop-up book evolved. And Ron Espiritu said, I want to use your curriculum. And we started, we wrote out a curriculum. And he says, you know, I'm teaching a class in South Central LA, and it's at South Animo, at Animo South Central. It's Black and Chicano studies. It's together in a class. And I want to do a lesson on hidden histories. I was like, awesome. Let's do it. It's a great allegory. Hidden histories popping up. And so that started happening. Then 2019 rolled around. And I was like, hey, we're doing like, we're going to unearth Tenochtitlan, the magical city on an island in the middle of the Lake Texcoco. And so elements of Tenochtitlan, we, we were exploring them, take one element, pop it up. And then uh, John Avalos was, got really involved in the Black Lives Matter movement. And a, an adjacent movement developed, victims, parent families of victims of police violence. And so he started doing these beautiful books for the families to resurrect the life and legacy of their loved one, to keep their struggle for justice alive. So that was an additional allegory. LGBTQ, two-spirit coming out and expression was another way that the pop-up book was expressed. Recently, the dichos and the ancestral knowledge of loved ones past for uh, Day of the Dead, we would do that. Another allegory, a way these, these uh, books were, were representing struggles, diverse struggles, intersectional struggles. And today, we have these continued book bands. In the back, I put out a few of these. I wish I had more. We said, you know what? There's always, a, in the arts, there's that element of whimsy, of, of, of playfulness, right? And so we're always being whimsical. And we said, you know what? We're going to begin this doctrine. We're going to create a church of pop apology. We're going to indoctrinate millions and bring them to our cause. But for that, we need a manifesto, like the communist, you know, like Marx, Engels, the communist manifesto. So we said we have to have a manifesto that will explain the cause, and then it itself will be a pop-up. Ta-da! A pop-up. 
then we came up with the, we went digging into the Mayan caves and we found a, a pop-up vu, a pop-up vu. This was for the Quincentennial. And there's a little, oh my goodness, there's the little Tenochtitlan city on the lake. And then we have this amazing allegory in, in represented in graphic cartoon by my old buddy, Lalo Alcaraz, the syndicated Chicano cartoonist. And what do we see besides a book burning? Does anyone see anything else? Because there's other histories in this image. Let's get classroomy for a second. There's, there's a book burning on the state of Arizona, and that was the, the law against Chicano studies, 2281. But do you see anything else? Another history, another reference to another history. Anybody? A volunteer? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's an anthropomorphic, you know, scaling of the, of the woman's face. So uh, a woman, of course, it's the destruction of woman's knowledge. Anything else? Anything else? The woman's color is brown or red. And this could also be the first book burnings, the first book bannings in the hemisphere is when the Inquisition crosses the Atlantic and you have the first um, book banning, the book burnings of the indigenous books, right? And so during the quincentennial, Dr. Saintly, rest in peace, one of our leaders, an academic Chicago Sage professor in Arizona, would give us these gems of analysis. And he said, you know, the attack on Chicano studies, it's not just an attack on a field of ethnic studies. This is civilizational warfare, y'all. And it's been going on for 500 years. They've been trying to assimilate us, Americanize us, Europeanize us, Christianize us. Not for 10 years, not for 50 years, for 500 years. They've been trying to assimilate us. They've been trying to make us something we're not, something that's more like them. The, the most powerful tool in the hand of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Stephen Biko said that, right? And here it is, y'all, 500 years ago. Landa, this is one of the most popular book burnings. He goes down into the Central American area and burns the Mayan books. People were devastated. Only like a dozen or so ancient codices still exist. He was a Franciscan monk. You know, the first assimilation is Christianity. They Christianized us. As Lorna de Cervantes, the poet, says so beautifully, they burned our ancient codices and the molten goddesses rose again in the ashes. 27 books and the people, the responses of the people are always recorded. They're devastated, right? And then there's always these contradictions. He, he gets arrested because some of the priests are nerdos and they appreciate books and knowledge. And they charge him for the crime of destruction of knowledge. And he writes a book to exonerate himself. All the knowledge of the Mayas, I know before I burned it. And becomes an expert on Maya knowledge. A contradiction, right? It's crazy. Do contradictions happen today? And then we have Juan de Sumaraga. Diego de Lando was taking cues from the first bishop of Mexico, Sumaraga, who in 1530, this is nine years after the fall of Tenochtitlan, the takedown of the Mexica system, that he has a, a official auto de fe. These were performances, massive performances, book burning. Sometimes they would get the bookmaker type books around his head and burn them at the stake. This was a, it was like a lynching. These were horrendous 
public displays of political power of, of, to convert the Indians, right? And, and then the intention, right, was to erase the past and open the way for a new era. So a beautiful chapter on this in Fernando Baez's Universal History of the Destruction of Books. Ramon Grosfogel from Berkeley calls it the four epistemocytes of the 16th century, the destruction of uh, Jewish and Arab knowledges in, in uh, Europe, the destruction of women's knowledges, the destruction of African knowledges, and then the destruction of indigenous knowledges, the four epistemocytes, the basis of Western white supremacy and, and ideological superiority. During this time, we read Song of the Hummingbird by Graciela Limon, and it reminds me of what we were doing. Uh, Susie Sepela just wrote a really influential book called Decolonizing uh, the Decolonial Queering, Queering the um, uh, Mesoamerican Diasporas. And she says in it, remembering is decolonial. So even just like knowing who you are and, and going back into those genealogies is decolonizing, right? I'm going to kind of survey this. Uh, the, the island city of Tenochtitlan was such a beautiful lesson and topic. Some of the pop-up books. I'm bringing student work and it's going to be interspersed into the exhibit and I hope you all check it out. I just wanted you to glimpse at these basic pop-up book techniques. One of my students at Dominguez Hills made this beautiful comparison. I, was, I would ask them to make connections to the present and he compared the um, pilgrimage of the Mexicas from Aslan to Tenochtitlan and he compared it to the uh, migration of the Central Americans in present day, the Central American caravan up to the United States with very similar lessons for us. And so I just want to show you these final slides on this important versatility. I'm sharing with you the methods and, and experiences and stories of the Chicano Papa book movement to connect them you know, to current struggles against book banning. Here are those books. You know, and, and I ask students in my classrooms, are, is there book banning here? And I want to quick, I want to ask that real quick. Is anyone aware of book banning? Maybe where you're, where you're from, at a school district nearby? Is anything like that going on? It happens in Southern California a bit. And, and recently, there's been a school board protest against LGBTQ student confidentiality rights. And that's a form of that. Recently, the state superintendent of schools outlawed Akesh and the Ashe affirmation, practices similar to the ancestor acknowledgments that we do in ethnic studies. And they recently removed them from a model curriculum trying to tell us what to do. I always try to stress self-determination, right? It was, uh, it was always part of ethnic studies in the early years, and we need to make it something that still, that we practice uh, today. Self-determination. We determine our own destinies. This is the, the class at South Central LA, the Black and Chicano Studies class. And uh, we told them, because you also have to be open to magic. And we told them, we, wanna, we, we got the stage set. All you need to do is come in and, and, and make your books. And millions of people will hear your message. And that semester, a reporter for NPR approached me and said, you know, I got your information uh, from somewhere. Could you? do an interview. And I said, you know what? I'm not teaching high school right now, but Ron Espiritu is, and you could contact him and NPR, and they were making pop-up books. And so they were featured in a 
story on national radio, national public radio. And then these images were on the website. And so it, the prophecy came through. Millions of people saw their pop-up books. This is how the LAPD closes a police commission meeting. And there's one of those pop-up books for the victims of, of police brutality and Black Lives Matters. Pop-up book images have popped up on the covers of LA Times stories and stories nationally. These are my last slides. At the beginning, in the early years, we we're trying to promote, hey, this thing is spreading. It's like a Andromeda strain. It's like a disease. It's a virus. COVID Chicano pop-up. Chicano pop-up 19. And, and then finally, we have this important episode happening today. You know what? They're going to be here. I don't know if anyone's connected to this. The Tampa Five? Is anyone connected to this movement? This is a group of five uh, women, young women, who protested the DeSantis laws, the attack on the gender studies department at the new college. And, you know, I I've, I've seen some of these young women. They're petite. They're under 120 pounds, maybe. And these giant police officers said that they were attacked. And, and they're facing, you know, assault charges on police officers, facing 10 years in prison, y'all. And they're coming around. They're on a national tour. They're going to be here at the end of the month, October 26th. And they're fighting. They're representing us in this battle. They're at the, at the front of it, right? They're, they're challenging the governor and, and uh, these attacks on gender studies, on book banning, and the racist laws, right? It's an intersectional struggle, and, and we're going to be a part of this. And then I also want to remind us, finally, that, you know, the reason for these attacks is because we're winning, is because we're successful, is because this movement has achieved so much. It's something to be proud of. And, you know, 12, 11 years ago, we said, when your education is under attack, what do you do? fight back. Thank you. And, and we also did, we had this theme of building, right? 11 years ago, we said, we're going to build. We're not just going to fight. We're going to build. So, so something exists in the long run with strong foundations, right? And, and we've done it. We've had so much accomplishment. And that's also the reason. We're on top, y'all. We're not at the bottom. We're on top. And we got to defend those accomplishments. And so I want to end with some chants, y'all. I want to, I want to, I want us to, you know, have, have, you know, pick up the energy. So I'm going to say the top and you guys say the second part. Ready? You can ban Chicano books. Still pop up. You can ban African-American studies books. And you can ban queer books. Thank you very much, y'all. That's my presentation. I'm really honored to be here. We might have a little sure, yeah. I know if you have to run off to class, that's it's understandable. All right, we're gonna open it up for questions. Anybody have a question? We have a mic going around. No pressure. Oh yeah, look, we have one, one of my oh, students. Right behind you. So my question is you were mentioning to pursue higher degrees of education and something that was stressed to me. When I was in one of the Chicano, it was like a program in the, my community college, they mentioned to me in particular that Latino men and specifically aren't pursuing their higher education. And what do you, like what kind of words of advice or, I don't know, consejos, like you said, would you have um, for someone like me who finds the whole process of pursuing like an MFA or a doctorate, like daunting, alienating, kind of, you know, there's no reference points in a lot of our families, like for any of this. So I don't know. And just any kind of words of advice, because I'm contemplating taking a gap year before attacking like my further education, but I don't know, just any consoles like you, you might have. That's already a good start. What area? I'm curious. What area are you? thinking about um, or areas sure i might just do an mfa in fine art i might i don't know i 
but considering the doctor but after like reviewing the process i give you guys props that sounds really crazy <laughs> but um, i'm not sure yet it's probably going to be in the arts to be honest with you photography probably specifically but oh that's exciting that sounds fun you got to do it you're already you're already i could tell you're already being smart about it and strategizing i think you have to you should have that vision try to like envision a uh, even a general idea, oh, I'm going to go out there and do this in the next four or five years. I thought I was going to rush through my PhD in four. I was going to, I'm going to do this fast, surprise everybody. Bam, I'm a doctor now. It took me eight. You know? It was tough, but persistence. Sometimes you have to be open to, you know, switching gears. Okay, now I got to go up an up uphill, put it in second gear. I have to go slower. Another thing is community and mentorship. I can't stress that enough. Like talking to our professors that were here earlier, the grad students are a little bit ahead of us, making friends when you get into that you know, program to, to get, you know, to create a little community, have someone you can ask questions of. And, you know, then the mentors are always good too, because once you get out of a program, you go get that job, you know, letters of rec, references. And then you need a whole nother set of consejo there too. And maybe you want to go into a postdoc or an internship or they'll, man, the, you know, the, the mentor, sometimes they'll open a door. You're over here pushing all these doors and they're like, let's try that one over there. And, and they facilitate tremendously. And then, you know, just... Hone that dream, you know, have that dream. And, and I applaud you. You're right. Men, men of color in particular, we're finding fewer, fewer, fewer men of color in just in college general and then in, in graduate programs. So, yeah, I'm so inspired by that. And just, you know, people of color in general, we need, we need us in those places, right? We're, we're in the future. We are the future, but you know what? We're going to need to take on responsibilities in that future too. So I, I applaud you and I, I, I support you in that. Yeah, and let's keep in touch. You know, you're in my class, right on. You don't have to be in my class too to keep in touch. In the back. Who in the I, I'm Alberto. I teach high school here in Eastside San Jose. All right. On. And we have, we don't necessarily have band books. I mean, we do, just not officially, yeah. you know, they don't tell us, right? But we have a certain list to go off by. And in that list, the literature provided does not encompass the realities of our students. It didn't encompass me. So I break the law and I teach all this Chicano literature, yeah. right? But how would you recommend, I don't know, maybe bringing awareness, petitioning, you know, I like to say chingar la madre a los the ones that are up top to <laughs> to make a change because a lot of a lot of students that I work with don't like to read. And it's not because they don't like it, it's just like the books suck. So, you know, how would you go around? Like what loopholes or I don't know, like consejos would you give? Yeah. And would you like to come through to the, the classroom one of these days? Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What what wow. school is it? Silver Creek. Silver Creek. Yeah. All right. It's like the bougie school on the east side, but oh, neat. Okay. It's right on. Yeah, 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 for sure. Let's talk after. You know, for some reason, a a, a thought that comes to mind is is um, uh, take care of yourself too, guard yourself. I've had my own experiences, and I've heard of experiences when you when you rock the boat. You know, we kind of we take arrows, you know, and we need to be there in that classroom for all those young people. We need to be solid there, solidly uh, placed. And so I, I do want to start off with that, you know, just, you know, don't, don't endanger yourself unnecessarily or, or if you do endanger yourself, endanger yourself very, very carefully and uh, formalizing, formalizing things, right? Like putting creating a, a club or, or, you know, um, you know, sealing it in a syllabus, right? Standardizing that syllabus. I love that process. Sometimes we overlook it, but like choosing the text, the, the 
age appropriate, reading level appropriate, culturally relevant appropriate, right? Sometimes there's a theme, something's going on. Like this this year, LGBTQ identity is being attacked. So I'm trying to have more texts that are intersectional, that address that. The other thing is, you know, I, I was teaching a class, a dual enrollment class. So these were high school students taking um, a, a ethnic studies class at a CSU. It was at CSU Long Beach. And, and it was black and brown kids and Asian Americans, a similar demographic to San Jose in Long Beach. And I chose Jesse by Gary Soto, a unique short novel it's really really thin it's about 100 pages and it was it's about gary soto's and uh, is anyone familiar with gary soto books he used to write children's books and and young adult and this novel it, it could be read in a college and, and it was perfect because it's that bridge between high school and college and now that there's community college classes I thought this this is a really well selected uh, piece of literature. It's not that long, so it's not intimidating. And then and then Gary Soto is part is like Lorna de Cervantes, Sri Moraga, Ana Castillo. It's that second generation of Chicana, Ch Chicano, Chicanx writers. It's like seventies and eighties, and they go through MFA programs, and so they're writing is very measured and they're trained writers and they're very like clean in their writing and they're like selecting words. Like every sentence is like really perfect. And so sentence, it's good to teach sentence structure, you know, and imagery, metaphor, composition in general, beautiful paragraphs, right? And, and I, I was so proud of selecting that book. And I was even more proud when, you know, my students, young black men, Chicano, Asian American students, they're eating it up. And, and, and it was, it was, it was just, it was like a finely chosen meal for them, you know? And so the art of creating a syllabus is really, is really nice. And then that's also something that goes back to that professionalization, you know, like the, the, you can explain to a principal, I selected these texts really carefully let, let me tell you right and you explain to them and the administrator has to acknowledge that like shoot oh oh i see this is a a well composed syllabus a plan an educational plan you know so things like that and they also th those things also protect you because when you're in the classroom sometimes we're out there it's beautiful to see a room like this we're like united we could march over right now, take over the president's office, just playing. But but when you're out there working, you're you're the only Chicano teacher at a school. Shoot, you need to go in there with some armor, you know. And so so, but you know, your work can can be part of that defense. That and I'll, it's, it's beautiful. It's solid, you know. And and one thing I remember. Uh, uh, a teacher told me when I began teaching, they said, you know what? Be genuine, be you, be loving. And the students, you don't need to explain that. They'll see it. They'll read you like a book. You know, I, I always appreciate it. And it was true. It came true. That was always a, but yeah, I hope that helped answer that question. And thank you. It was a great question. Thank you. Oh, here we go. A question right here in the blue. Okay. Hello, Professor. Thank you for your talk. Very inspiring. I'm sorry I came up late, but it was very enjoyable. So I have a question. I noticed that a lot of people, including me, myself, I'm guilty of this, is that we are somewhat like distant, apathetic to the struggles of Chicano, Chicanx people and African-Americans and other people of color. Some people, they... They, they are very ambivalent or they don't speak out or they just stay quiet. And sometimes they just like, I'm seeing these things on the media is to work for me. I don't like it. So how can we address this? How can you address this? Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
I love the Bay Area. I love coming up here. I'm from LA, West LA, and there's this beautiful tradition up here. That's unique. That's like the third world strike, the third world liberation front. And I always attended Berkeley. I had friends at San Francisco State. I know things like that happen here at San Jose State. And there's there's a solidarity. And that's one of our principles right now in ethnic studies. There's like the five S's. One of them is solidarity. And there's this, you know, this beautiful tradition of the groups coming together. I think we can always look back to look back at what what they did, how they did it. I think another thing is, you know, like my sisters, when they went to college, they couldn't stand the Chicanos, as particularly the Chicano men. The Chicano men were all, you know, dressing like cholos, uh, uh, flannel shirts, sarapes, baggy clothes, talking mean, you know, because that's how they they were trying to transform the system. And my sisters, we, if you, if you knew my sister, my sisters are that's not their style. They didn't like that. And, and they, but they found a way to participate. My sister was the editor of the newspaper, of a Chicano newspaper, La Gente. And so finding your, your role, not everyone is going to be out there on a microphone rallying, right? Not everyone is vociferous, right? And so, you know, there's, but there's so many roles to play. I was speaking with a friend of mine. Whose, whose son attends San Jose State, Andy, I don't know, by some mirror, is Andy's son here? Maybe not. Okay, he's not here. But I needed to ask that. But he told me, he was involved in the American Indian movement that the CIA went after real violently. And he said, he was telling me, speak with your heart, you know? Speak with your heart. Don't, I know you got all those credentials. You're up here a lot, but when you go up there, you know, speak with your heart. And so, and then also he said, he told me, oh, today, man, there's too many chiefs, not enough warriors. And I love a thing Leonard Peltier said in the movie Incident at Oglala about the American Indian movement. He said, what is a warrior? Warrior isn't someone that's carrying a gun and walking around all macho, sometimes that is expressed that way. But a warrior is someone that works for the people, carries the buckets of water, asks, asks the grandmother, hey, what, what do we need, you know? Well, you need me to go get something from town and carry it here. Like whatever, uh, sometimes asking, right? Hey, what do we need? You, you know what I needed? I needed technical help earlier. Where are the tech warriors? There they are right there. You know, like we uh, people play different roles. My, my sisters were good at putting together a layout on a, uh, and, and asking people, hey, can you contribute photographs, articles, poetry to the newspaper? Uh, they found a role by asking, you know. And so, but you know what? It begins with your question, like that desire. How do I get involved? You know, asking, approach, having the courage to approach. And I applaud you and I honor you for asking the question. That was a beautiful question. I hope I, I helped answer it. And then all y'all are way more tech savvy than I am, like tech. And y'all are here in the Silicon Valley. You know, of course, there's some bad, bad side to it. But also, you know, y'all are developing such important skills. All of you are so valuable in the movements to come. Another one, look, another, yeah. So thank you for your earlier answer. I have another question. So I do notice that there are certain people in certain ethnic minority communities, they somehow they buy into these uh, conservative and white supremacist mm -hmm. ideas that are very harmful to them and to other people who like them. So what can we do to address this? Because like, for example, if you say like, okay, uh, this minority is suffering, but then another minority say, oh, I'm doing fine and we have to follow this. So what do you think about that? 
Uh, wow, that's a really good question. There's, you know, it caught my surprise. The those, I mean, I, I hate, I hate to bring these up, but like some of these violent attacks in New Mexico, a friend of mine, they were protesting a statue being built of Oñate, Spanish colonizer of Albuquerque in New Mexico, and uh, a young man showed up, white supremacist, and he was Mexican American. And he, and he ended up shooting someone with a gun, real tragic. And we're saying prayers for Jacob right now that he recovers from being shot. The Uvalde massacre happened a year ago. And who shot all those poor, innocent children? I think over 28 and two teachers. A Mexican-American who had, who had picked up, you know, he, he also had mental health issues. And he had guns. And he had resentment. I think towards his grandmother or the or the mother that worked at the school, but he also picked up white supremacist ideologies. And there's a lot of people in our communities and our own families, I speak personally too, that are Trump supporters, you know. And so that's a big challenge. I challenge them. The the few that I do engage with, I try to engage with them. An intellectual battle, y'all. We all have to be Jedi warriors. We have to develop that confidence to engage, you know, verbally, rhetorically, ideologically, but maybe also, you know, spiritually. I kind of do. I, I, you know, I, I joke. We got to do some Jedi mind tricks. But you know what? There ain't no such thing as a Jedi. But we can become Jedi warriors still, right? We have to use that power. Martin Luther King, before he was killed, he said, the, the energy of the universe bends towards love. He said, we're going to win because, because the universe wants us to win. You can believe in that power, you know? We have to believe ourselves, develop that confidence. You know, when I was growing up, we used to ride, what well, was to drive cars all over California. And then through the teatro, it took me to different cities. And I used to take joy in driving other people's cars, especially if they're unique, weird, random cars. So I've driven all kinds of cars, old Volvos, you know, but. Uh, uh, cars with weird ass stick shifts up here. Is anyone is anyone familiar with these? There's these old trucks where the stick shift is up here, and I I, I had joy in, in learning how to drive different cars. But th out of that developed this confidence that I was a Jedi driver. I had I had magical powers to drive anywhere and any vehicle I could. And that I could drive it safely, and that I could avoid a disaster and and crashing, you know. Piece of wood. Yeah, it's wood. And 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 I developed a confidence, you know. And I drive on the freeways in the streets of L.A. A very nice, beautiful, violent place to drive a car. And I need that confidence. And and I'm also, I also pride myself in that confidence, but. I think we can we can develop Jedi mind powers, you know, to to take on these. And, and we have we're going to need those skills because, as I try to prove, you know, the the Trump and and the conservative ideologies are not well founded. They're founded by most observances on on egos, political egos, uh, horrible campaigns to attack the weak you know, to attack immigrants, to attack LGBTQ students, young people, to, to attack my racial minorities, to attack the poor, to attack mothers, on uh, single mothers on welfare, you know, that's how a lot of politicians survive. They, they can attack the weak, you know, and we, we, ha we have to be defenders of the weak. I saw one of my old friends on the Santa Monica Pier, and he's an old ex-cholo, ex-gang member, now Trump supporter. Me and him got into a really bad argument, almost came to blows. And I saw him on the pier, 
And I said, hey, what's up, Chris, man? He goes, hey, what's up with you, man? He tried to get in my face. And I told him, and he said, they're trying to turn all our kids gay, you know? They're trying to turn all our kids gay. I go, hey, why are you believing that? That ain't true. You know what it is? They're attacking the, the weakest, the, the kids that are most vulnerable. Those LGBTQ kids that you're attacking, they have the highest suicide rates. Why are you attacking them, man? Why are you attacking the weak? And he, he, he tripped out. He's like, got me, you know, touche. I got him, you know, Jedi mind tricks, you know. Go, go think about that. Go think about, you know, why, why you do the things you do or, the, or think the way you do. I go, hey, stop watching Fox News, man. And we walked away. I go, hey, but good seeing you. Good seeing you, my homie. <laughs> we grew up together. He's like, he's almost like family, right? Uh, Trump supporter. But y'all you, you, are in the right place at a university, developing your mind powers, right? Yeah, thank you for that. Great questions. Any of my students here? Any students here left? Yeah, oh, please come up and say hi. I got, got a little gift for y'all. Yes, yeah. Hey, Claudina. Violeta, thank you. Ask question or comment? Oh, sweet. Oh, yes, you must. <laughs> extra credit. It's extra credit, too. You know? uh, I had to step out because the chair stopped working. But thank you for coming back. I love it. Um, I just wanted to share with you um, when I was 17 and taking an English class. I took, I think everyone can hear me. I, <laughs> okay. I took an English honors class and had to read Alex Haley's autobiography of Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. That was my first, this is before, I was uh, not to date myself, but 90. So this is before the Spike Lee movie and everything. And I read it and I just remember my mind was blown in a way that it hadn't been blown because this was an experience way far outside of my experience and I just remembered that consciousness raising feel, feeling that you're talking about. And this idea, I used to tell students about consciousness raising. We all got sold on this Disney idea. I don't know if anybody remembers Remember the Titans, but it's a hilarious movie where it's about the 50s and civil rights, but all like major racial conflicts are are solved through dance. They break into Motown and then suddenly everything is okay. And so we got sold on this idea of it's supposed to be a pleasant experience, a coming together happiness, but consciousness raising is painful. And it usually starts, it's Napantla. It's a space between two wa water where you're not this or that. It's restricting and it's expansive. So I just remember as a reader taking on obviously the, the perspective of the protagonist. And so when I think about reading outside of my own identity, that's been one of the gifts of reading is that I, and that's that frontal lobe development that you're talking about. So not to suggest that I have that experience, but that I can have empathy and that I could see the world bigger and with more people in it. And I remember running into a friend who walked up to me and asked me what I thought of the book. This is 17 and I said, I was beginning to talk about, you know, my 17 vocabulary, the, the experience that I had. And the friend, before I could talk, the friend said, well, I just thought it was terribly racist, all of that white devil stuff and all this stuff. And I knew at that moment, even though I was 17, that I was on a different trajectory, that I was on a different, a different path. Not that I had transcended race, but I had touched and glimpsed what it is to be a human being and to have that human experience. And that's actually what I think of when I think of ethnic studies, more so than is about this coming together of a peoplehood where we can transcend the traps of identity that historical forces of power beyond our control have put upon us. And I'm not getting into that one world, one love stuff, you know, let's all go to a one world music festival. I'm not getting into that. What I'm saying is, is that that's what literature of that nature does for us. Is it takes us beyond these constructs. And I think that that's actually why they want to ban it. Because as long as we can continue to have these horizontal, as one of the greats would say, I don't know, she's probably banned as well, Angela Davis, when we have these horizontal fights, when we fight amongst each other, like your friend turning homophobic because of that old school cultural nationalism of the Chicano movement, I've actually had the same conversations with the vanguard too, that come up on these transphobic 
as we know. And I do the same Jedi mind trick about, don't you remember what it is to feel excluded? Don't you remember what it is to feel pushed out of the room? And then there's that pause. So I really feel that that's actually the construction, the constructive power of ethnic studies, the joy of it. But we have to all acknowledge the pain of it as well. Thank you, Ella. Yeah, that's so important that the joy and the pain. Yeah, yeah. I used to, when I was on Facebook, Facebook was the devil. It would suck up all my energy. I had to drop out of Facebook just to complete my PhD. It was right when it came out. Well, when I started getting into it, I remember it'd be like, oh, it's uh, 10 p.m. I'm just going to check out the little thing. Oh, my God, my ex-girlfriend. I wonder what she's doing. Going, oh, I didn't know their friends. And oh, look at this article. I'm going to peek at it real quick. And then I look at the clock, 1.30 in the morning. But wait, it was 10 p.m. just a minute ago. Social media, man, it, it, it was eating, eating me up. And then we'd get on arguments, fights too. And I, I, I remember social media taught me this, like stop posting all the terrible stuff. Uh, balance it. Let's do some celebratory stuff too. Uh, victories. So the pop-up book was also about whimsy. I remember the, there was a year where the, the hate crimes went up. They skyrocketed during the Trump students. And then there was like a little plague at UC Riverside right before COVID, like a year before. And our students were all haggard. And we said, you know what? Fun times. I'm, I'm changing. Uh, John Avalo said this. I'm just doing fun stuff. I want my students, I'm going to pick up their spirits. That's my goal this semester. Make everything fun, you know? And and so we, I remember we had a year and it was just fun. And the pop-up book was part of that. And so we try to use, and, you know, kind of to the point of what I was telling the teacher in the back, like, take care of your spirit too. You know, make sure, you know, we, we celebrate. But I'm glad you brought up the hard times because we also have to want those hard times. We have to have we have to go into the library, put in work. You have to do work. Uh, I would always tell my students during the final papers, work pays. Work pays. You 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 want an A, put in work. Put in work and, and that work will produce something that you will you will love. Don't do that much work. We'll see what you get. You know, you get what you you not only get what you pay for, you get what you work for. But yeah, there's always that, you know, dialectic, that back and forth. But but you're, what you were saying also reminds me of um, when I was in, in grad school at UCLA in the film program, I had a, a partner and, and she would say, I don't know why I'm sharing this, but you, you reminded me of it. She said, do, do you know Black Facts? little black facts because yeah we have black facts and uh Pancho Villa was Mexican Pancho Villa was no no she said Pancho Villa was black Pancho, I haven't heard that one and, I, and I'm a you know I'm all into Chicano I go maybe Zapata but Pancho Villa was black I didn't have nothing I had no comeback she got me she says yeah it's common black fact black facts and I was like dang it man so the next day I came back, I go, well, you know what? Malcolm X is a Chicano. She's like, no, no, he ain't. I go, yeah, he is. You didn't know that? Where was Malcolm X's mom from? From the islands. She was Caribbean, Latinx, you know? Not Chicano, but close. Gotcha, you know? But, the, but in the dialectic, in the struggles, in the back and forth, there's also, that's how you build solidarities too, though, right? True love, get it through work, through paying the dues, through the, the joy and the pain, right? It's not just all celebration. It's not just all happy times, sad times too, right? But it's not just sad times. It's like work, right? Work pays. And I encourage you all as students, as undergrads, oh, it's such a beautiful time, you know? It's such a foundational time for the rest of your life. Enjoy it, 
but put in that work and you'll, you'll treasure it even more. I applaud you. I thank you for being out here. And give yourselves a round of applause also for being here at San Jose State University. I applaud you. Oh, let's end with the unity clap, right? This is part of the movement. Start off slow. Then we build up. Well, I want to thank you for your time and being here. The week is not over. <laughs> if you have to come to more of these events for your class, there's some tomorrow in this room at noon. We have band book storytelling theater, words of the suppressed. They're going to be reading from some of the band books, about six band books. Then following that at 3.30, we have evidence of things not seen with Dr. Daniel B. Summerhill as part of our Unbanned Author Speaker Series. So please come back and enjoy us again. Thanks.